Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for all coming to our event today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Mary Love. Um, I work over in the STEM Center as an instructional assistant. Um, and today we have an excellent panel of women to, in honor of Women's History Month. Um, so during this panel, our panelists will be discussing a little bit about their experiences as women in the STEM fields, but also about how they're using their expertise and experiences to create products, programs, or apps that are life-changing. So I wanted this discussion to not just be about the struggles that exist for women in STEM, but I also wanted our three women to share with you how they are combining their compassion, passion, and levering, leveraging STEM and tech and their influence for good. Um, so with that, I'm going to have our panelists introduce themselves. So if you want to just say um, your name, where you work, a little bit about what you do, maybe where you went to school. <laughs> Um, yeah, and then you want to start? Sure. <coughs> good afternoon. I was about to say good morning. Um, my name is Danielle Rose, and I'm the Chief Programs Officer at SMASH, which is um, or what's formerly known as Level Playing Field Institute. And so we're the education focus area of the K4 Center, and we are really working to prepare young people, underrepresented people of color, for STEM, um, and not just to pursue, but persist and ultimately excel in that program, um, I'm sorry, in that particular field, while also encouraging our young people to have a um, sense of social awareness, responsibility, um, and we really push that, encourage that way of thinking as it relates to how they approach their education and ultimately um, their careers. So that's a little bit about our program. I oversee all of our programs. We have now uh, seven across this country. Um, we are in California here at UC Berkeley, which is where the program was founded. And we've since expanded to Stanford, UC Davis, UCLA, um, Morehouse in Atlanta, Wayne State in Detroit, Wharton at the University of Pennsylvania, and uh, I think I'm missing one. I feel like, oh, I'm sorry. We're now launching this summer, actually, in Chicago at the Illinois Institute of Technology. So my phone is on vibrate, please excuse me. Um, so yeah, so we basically work with high school students uh, the summer after they start their um, freshman year and we work with them to and through high school and then now even as they are transitioning into college. And so it's a STEM intensive college preparatory program where the students reside on these various campuses for five weeks for three years. And then during the academic year, they actually have uh, various Saturday programming to ensure the continuity of what they've learned during the summer. So that's a little bit about SMASH. Um, as it relates to myself, I am Berkeley born, Oakland raised. Um, I haven't lived here. I just moved back, not just, but five years ago after being away for about 20 years, uh, where I pursued my undergrad and graduate studies in math and mechanical engineering at Spelman College in Atlanta and also Georgia Tech. And so, and then I did some, my first career was actually in the energy space. And then I left corporate and transitioned to the education space in about 2010. So um, coming up on my 10 year anniversary of uh, redeeming myself, if you will. So um, yeah, that's a little bit about me. Looking forward to talking to you, talking with you all and, and learning about what you may be interested in and any questions that I can answer, happy to do so. Uh, hi everyone. Hi everyone, my name is Sargun Kaur, um, and I'm a Bay native, uh, grew up in Fremont, and then went to college at Berkeley, um, pursued computer science, which was a journey in and of itself of how I got through it, why I chose that major, we'll talk about it. Um, after that, I uh, joined Google as a software engineer. I worked on the Google Maps backend team, and then I worked on Google Photos, um, the Android side for two years. And then um, last year, actually pitched a startup to Google's incubator, got funded, so I've been working on that and um, growing the product and my team um, since then. Uh, so I'm the CEO and co-founder of Byteboard. Um, it's funded through Google's incubator called Area 120. What Byteboard really was solving or is working to fix um, technical interviews across the industry. 
So um, for those of you pursuing computer science or pursuing technical careers, you might have heard of you know, Cracking the Coding Interview, that book. It's kind of like a manual that you have to study of like algorithms and data structures and so forth. Um, but the way that the technical interview process works today um, allows for a lot of subjectivity and a lot of bias to come into the system. And the questions that we ask in our technical interviews are oftentimes um, some things that like you have to study months for, even if you're an engineer. Like today, as you know, a fairly strong performing software engineer at Google, if you asked me to go interview at Facebook or Apple or whatever that might be, I'd tell you like, give me a month, give me two months to study. Um, and in your head, you're like, well, aren't you an engineer? Like, aren't, how, aren't you like working as an engineer every day? Like, why can't you just go interview and showcase your skills, which is what you would think um, you should be able to do. But the interview is something that you have to practice, and it's a whole other set of skills that oftentimes disproportionately um, affects individuals that don't have that kind of time, that don't um, have those resources. There are certain um, elite schools that offer, um, elite colleges that offer technical interview courses to their students. Not every school across the country has those courses or has those professors. So overall, um, I heard a ton of different stories from folks um, who said they were they had so much anxiety around the technical interview process or they couldn't get through it or they didn't have the right resources. Um, I myself have sat on hiring committees at Google. I've been an interviewer at Google and both an interviewee as well. So I've seen kind of the entire process end to end. Um, and there's so many stories of um, it not being, um, it being like a performative thing, right? Like you have to get into a room and like, showcase and talk in front of a whiteboard and demonstrate your skills. And there's so much anxiety in that process. Um, so we're creating an interview that's more effective, that's more holistic and representative of what you would be doing on the job as an engineer. So it's a project-based interview. We can talk about it. Um, we're creating an interview that's more efficient. So it doesn't, it saves engineering's time um, in terms of doing and doing the interviews, but also saves candidates time when you're interviewing for so many different companies. And lastly, most importantly, um, we're trying to create an interview that's equitable, that's a fair and positive experience for everyone to showcase and demonstrate their skills, uh, regardless of the background or the schooling that they came from. Uh, yeah. Um, hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarai Espinosa Salamanca. I am founder and CEO of Dreamers Roadmap. It's a free national mobile app where we help undocumented students across the country find scholarships to go to college. So I was born in Lázaro Cárdenas, Michoacán, Mexico, and immigrated to this country when I was four years old. I kind of did the whole educational route like every other child in this country. But everything changed for me my senior year of high school. Um, when I went to my counselor and I told her the situation that I was in and uh, found out that I wasn't eligible for financial aid because of the status that I was in. Um, and she told me that students like me couldn't go to college. So I think for me that was a huge turning point um, because I'm the youngest of 11 children, the first one in my family to try to pursue a college education. So if you guys are first generation, you know exactly what I'm talking about and how difficult it is to not have anyone at home or in your family that can help you through that process and how daunting that could be to even think that you're uh, good enough or prepared enough to even pursue a college education. Um, after graduating from high school um, and not having, a, I guess, a clear path to college, I left Los Angeles where I went to high school came back to the Bay Area, and it wasn't until I came back that a lady from my church actually told me about something called AB 540. Um, and that's when I started looking into other opportunities through the state provided to undocumented students for financial support. Was able to get myself through college. I did community college, and then I went off to Stanford. Um, and I was able to launch Dreamers Roadmap thanks to a national competition uh, where they were ask, asking exactly that, like how could we solve problems in our community using technology? And prior to this, I had never even thought of like me ever being involved with technology, like ever. One, because I think until I went to college, I knew what STEM was. And two, because when you look at technology or anything, even to this day, and it's slightly changing now, you hardly see any people of color and women even less. So it was very, um, very terrifying to even have the, the guts or the courage to apply to this competition. 
Thankfully, I applied. I won first place in the country and was able to get the funding to build this tool that is now has helped more than 30,000 people across the country get into college. Thank you all. Um, cool. So my first question for you, and you all, sorry, you kind of touched on it already, but um, what made you interested in the tech or the STEM space, and what motivated you to keep going even when you felt like there was barriers or str um, struggles in the way? Um, I want to start. <laughs> oh, should I just go on? Okay. Sure. Yeah, you can go on. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so what, what uh, inspired me kind of to do yeah. it? Um, I think despite the fact that I was terrified to go in because there was nobody that looked like me, that also was my inspiration to go into the field. Um, again, because growing up, I didn't really have a lot of people of color or women of color that I could look up to that had these like amazing careers. Um, and like I think I hadn't really met anyone uh, that was an immigrant Mexican women that had a tech CEO position. Um, so I think for me, that was one of my motivators, that there wasn't people like me in these positions, and I wanted to be in that position to inspire younger generations and other women of color in my community, that they could too uh, be founders and CEOs of their own tech companies. And I think for me, um, once I started getting involved with technology, what really inspired me to continue to pursue this, um, despite the fact that there's still, I think to this day, many times where I want to give up, um, is the impact that we're making in people's lives and how technology could really solve so many problems in our communities. And we are the people that should be solving them because we're the ones that have gone through them. But very, very, very little uh, times do they give us the opportunity to actually express those ideas? Um, so I'm so grateful for the Voto Latino Innovators Challenge that gave us that opportunity. And I'm always constantly on the lookout for opportunities like that um, to share with our audience and like people around me and in my community because I think that we are all capable and smart enough to build companies. We just need to have the uh, people who have these, I guess, at the end of the day, it's the money, right? that are willing to give us that, that resource and that capital to say, hey, I believe in you. Like, what have you gone through in your life that you would like to fix? I'm giving you the money um, to build it, right? So that's what I like to think to myself. Like, if you had all the money in the world, if you could solve anything in the, in the world or in your community, what would it be? And just write it down. Like, start thinking about it. Start brainstorming it. Because you'll, like, I think opportunities like that come when you least expect it. And when they do, you'll be prepared, right? So I'm very, um, I'm a big fan of like being prepared for the opportunity. And if you're not prepared when an opportunity shows up, then that might have been your only shot. Um, so write it down. Um, Y'all are capable enough and smart enough. Y'all have gone through so much as, as people of color in community college. I know what it's like and I know what you have been through because I was there. And even in that process, there's so many things that I could, I wish I could fix. And y'all have the capability to do that through technology. Um, one thing I would say, like, you talk about money, right? Like, mm -hmm. we need to find access to people w with money to, like, fund our ideas. And that's something that I often think about, too, that venture capital and, like, that space that awards money and kind of, like, bets on startups and bets on ideas is, like, even, like, harder. it's it's even harder. It's, yeah. like, even more full of, like, <clears throat> white men, right? Yep. Um, so... The fact that like when your when your startup is successful, goes and um, and gets bigger, like you kind of like going up and um, like having access to money, um, you get to make those ideas, you get to make those bets on those startups on y'all, right? Mm -hmm. um, that currently we're fighting for. Yeah. Currently, because we're women CEOs or we're female CEOs or we're women of color CEOs, when we go to those venture capitalists, they often don't believe in our ideas, or we have to like kind of like create opportunities for ourselves and work through barriers that oftentimes a lot of the men in the community don't um, or a lot of the white men in the community don't. So you end up seeing startups or ideas that get funded are, are kind of focusing on a very narrow lens because that's, that's their perspective. Um, so to get access to that kind of barrier or that kind of tier, um, that's one of the things that also encourages me to like keep working on what I'm working on. Um, but also like computer science, it, at least for me, what I kept telling myself was like, 
I don't just have to be an engineer, right? I don't just have to be like working to like fix a feature in this one thing. Um, it was, I had a struggle with like, kind of like going through college. I, I ended up choosing computer science as a junior um, when I was in college, so pretty late. Um, and by that time, everyone in my class of like a thousand students, 90 plus, 90% 90 plus being men, um, were just, it seemed like to me, it felt like to me that they were, they had been coding since like they were five, right? They got the answers really quick. They like knew what algorithm to work. They never had to debug their code. And I would spend days just like working through an algorithm, working through debugging code and be like, this is not for me. Clearly everyone else gets it. Um, and that a lot of it had to do with a not having like the support in place or seeing folks that like look like me or were like, you know, didn't have the resource or didn't grow up like thinking they were going to become engineers. Um, so one of the reasons I stuck through it was like, A, I knew I loved problem solving. I like loved actually doing it when it worked. Like when your code works, it's like such a euphoric feeling. Um, and B, like I was like, I can use this foundational computer science knowledge and apply it to anything. Um, as our world grows to become more and more dependent on technology, no matter what field that we're in, um, I knew that like that foundation would be really helpful for me. Um, one of the things I will add is the I like really sought out mentors, and that's pretty late in the game. Once I got to Google, I sought out mentors that um, were women of color. Um, and um, and actually men, because they have access to opportunities that oftentimes like I don't have access to or I didn't know of um, to help support me. And that's like been a really, really helpful um, for me to stick through it, um, knowing that like it's not just in my head, that I'm not just like the only one feeling like an imposter, like oftentimes 99% of the community around us is too. And to be able to talk through that um, was really helpful for me. Do you want to? I'll, I'll try and keep it a little <laughs> brief in terms of my journey. Um, so yeah. I started the STEM journey in sixth grade. Uh, I was in Mesa. I'm not sure if folks are familiar with Mesa. Um, and I was at Cal Berkeley. And my mother had put me into um, Mesa because I liked to, I was just always tinkering at home. If something broke, I wanted to understand why and how to fix it. So something as simple as like the belt on the vacuum, like what happened? So I would dismantle the vacuum and put it back together, fix it. And so that's kind of, I've, I'm now like Mr. Fix It at my, or Miss Fix It at my <laughs> mom's house um, as a result. But uh, you know, nonetheless, I, so I started this journey um, very early on and continued with Mesa Pre-College Academy. Then um, I was awarded a NASA uh, scholarship full ride for undergrad, and then Ford Motor actually sponsored my graduate school um, programming as well. So I, I was in these different fields and um, interned at Jet Propulsion Laboratory a few summers, was at Ford Motor for a few summers. And along the way, what really kept me going was truly the support of my sisters, my Spelman sisters. We were all on this journey together. We came in as a cohort. We were Y scholars, women in science and engineering. And that really was, um, you know, to, to know that there were others along this path. Um, I, even when I was in spaces where I did not see myself, it absolutely helped me um, to keep going. And so I, I think community and having support is really critical. Um, one thing that, you know, along my way and, and what ultimately I won't say ultimately, but absolutely informed my decision to transition out of corporate America and go into the education space was that I took this path a little blindly. Um, all I knew, the message that just kept, I kept being bombarded with was, if you get an engineering degree, you can write your own ticket. Uh, just get an engineering degree. There was this big, I was, I mean, there's been a few waves of pushing, uh, at the time, the language was my minorities. If you're a minority, you got an engineering degree, you're good. Um, and so I, I pursued that path. And to your point earlier, Sarkhan's point around 
having a computer science degree and then recognizing though I don't have to be just a computer scientist like there are so many different avenues to pursue that was the the understanding with engineering and that's actually what ended up playing out for me um, having that foundation and just in terms of that training of you know critical analysis and really problem solving in a manner that um, was efficient and and uh, basically how do you optimize uh, different pathways to get to whatever solution you're trying to um, solve for, I think was something that um, really afforded me these different opportunities and being a woman of color. But when I transitioned, or reason, one of the reasons why I transitioned into education and with Smash in particular was, we can't do this blindly. I, I, I don't want to just tell our young people, get a degree, get a degree in CS, and um, just because you have to, you need to. Um, I really want people, young people in particular, to travel this path of, of understanding why they are pursuing engineering, why they are pursuing math, why they're pursuing computer science, um, and be able to marry it with whatever your passions are, whatever you know you tend to gravitate towards just naturally. How can technology, how can STEM actually play a role? in whatever it is you really enjoy, what brings you joy, because that's ultimately what's going to keep you going along a journey that's not necessarily occupied with people that look like you or may come from the background that you come from. So that's um, that's what's charged me the second go round of my career in education is to um, try to adjust what was done for me in a way that I think could have just that much greater of impact, that people stay in whatever um, realm of STEM they decide to pursue. Cool, thank you all. Um, so I know some of you talked about um, finding mentors or uh, connecting with like your sisters. Um, so how how did you go about how do you go about finding allies or resources or um, people that can help you support you along the way in your jobs and your careers and personal life? Oh. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, I think. One, it's a matter of even coming to events like this, right? I, I think when you you start to commune and see that there are other people that are on this journey, um, just starting by having a conversation uh, and or even with us here connecting with folks um, that are on panels or just in different spaces that you know they're at least convening for the purpose of STEM, equity, um, and, and I think that's one, one way um, that you can go about uh, communing and, and creating a network. I think there's also um, uh, just being fearless in the sense of, you know, if you see, if you read about somebody online, we, I didn't have the World Wide Web uh, when I was coming up. Um, it's just now 30 years old, so I'm um, beyond that. Um, and so that was, you know, I didn't necessarily have that that vehicle to really explore and see, well, who's out there? And it's about cold, not calling necessarily, because I don't think we folks use the phone to call anymore too much, but maybe <laughs> it's a matter of tweeting at somebody, or maybe it's um, sending them on LinkedIn a message, um, and or LinkedIn is really good too in the sense that you can see who you might be connected to and using those folks to actually or let me not say use, but leveraging those folks to um, form an introduction <laughs> for you. And, and I think that's another way to start to grow your network. Um, I wasn't the best at it when I was in the workplace. Um, I ended up having champions kind of come to me. And that's one thing, um, you know, being you tokenization is real, right, in corporate America. And you can you can leverage that, you know, to your own um, benefit. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, folks came to me because I was definitely, um, I checked boxes. I, I was a woman. I was a black woman. I was a black woman with um, multiple degrees in engineering and, and math. And so, um, and I worked hard. And, and so when you show that and you have this background, folks will come to you as well. And you should be open and, and receptive to that, um, 
that approach and seeing how folks, you know, what they are up to. Sometimes it's for their own kind of checking the box of, well, I'm giving back. Let them give back and let them help you. Um, I would say that is another route to go as well. And I want to let my co-panelists <laughs> talk more about what they what their journeys are. I think you covered most of it. So okay, yeah, yeah. All right. okay, cool, <laughs> great. Um, do you ever feel like you had to choose between like a strictly STEM or tech career and giving back to your community? And how can our students do both for when they graduate and go into the um, go into the workforce? Um, I think just one more thing that I'd like to touch back on, like the mentors thing, okay. is to not be afraid to ask for help. Um, I, I'm, I'm still getting better at that. Like I, I, I do kind of do the cold calling of like people that I see. I'm like, ooh, like that person's like so dope. Like let me find them on LinkedIn real quick, and I send them a message. They reply. Like they will reply. They are human. Also, I think a lot of times we think like, oh, they're so far, at, like far <laughs> out. Like I, I can't even touch them. But they're actually human. They're really nice. Uh, so don't be afraid to reach out to those people, and don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, and I think for me, that's what has helped me find the right people in my network that have supported me. Being vulnerable on on what it is you really need um, has given me a very clear path and has helped these people who are super busy but also human um, have a direct answer for me whenever it is that I need it. So also having that in mind, right? Like um, reach out, but reach out with an ask um, to have them help you the best that they can. And then as far as the question, I think for me, it just, I, I might have gotten lucky because it just came together, yeah. right? Like I think for me, it, it wasn't that I had to choose my community or tech. Yeah. They just, they merged. Um, and I think it was all based on my personal experience, right? That's what I was talking about before. Like my personal experience was what inspired me to be able to build a tool to serve others just like me in my community that were coming after me. Because being in that situation and feeling like as terrible as I did my senior year and thinking that I really wasn't good enough or thinking that this counselor was right, that people like me couldn't go, uh, was terrible. And I'm like, how many other people are going through the same thing? And when it was happening to me, honestly, I'm like, I'm probably the only person in the country who's going through this. Because that was back in 2008 when it wasn't like I'm undocumented and afraid movement. Not yet. Um, so it was very isolating. Um, but I think after that, it was like there's 65,000 students a year in the same situation. And I think when I started doing my research and finding these numbers and knowing that there were so many other people in the same situation, I'm like, I have to do something. And that's how I think both, both uh, worlds merged for me. And um, yeah, I've just been very fortunate to be able to give back to the community that I come from. That's something I definitely struggled with when I first started my career. Um, I joined at Google, and like the first year, first two years, I was just like, you know, would go into work, I'd do, I'd like work on my team, work on the feature, like code all day, and then go home. And I realized like how burnt out I was getting, just like being so isolated in that work and that community and that, um, like the folks in my team were great, but like just in that kind of very small or particular narrative and conversation. Um, and so I started trying to see like what other groups or, or things I could join. And Google has, Google's like a campus, like as many organizations you probably have here, there's the same number of organizations like at Google, it's like a college campus, you'll have a ukulele club, you'll have like a woman group, like, you know, there's just so many different groups. Um, so I tried to start reaching out and kind of just joining in on meetings and going, going to things like that. Um, and even on my particular team, um, you know, we started putting together like a diversity council. We started kind of putting together some more leadership opportunities to understand like how is the culture on our team doing, how are things like that. And I started getting more involved there where I was still doing my day-to-day -day work as I was, but I was interacting in, um, in different kind of conversations that really empowered me or like made me feel like I was more than just an engineer on the team. And that was really important to me. Um, having like you know, like volunteered with the Black Googlers Network or like volunteered with the Asian Googlers Network, like do, done events with them, done a ton of panels, had mentors, had mentees, um, worked at schools, worked at universities, um, did events there across the country. Um, that's what really excited me and what like um, helped me do better even at the work that I was like 
doing as an engineer because I was more passionate about it and more less burnt out. Um, and that led into you know me gaining leadership opportunities, me um, gaining the confidence to in the work that I did, um, in showing up more at meetings and like calling out or like saying things and speaking up, which led to um, you know thinking about the startup. I went to a hackathon. That's where I met my co-founder. Um, and these are all things I wouldn't have done if I was burnt out or if I was only like singularly focused on the work that I was doing. Um, and I was able to like leverage the space and um, the, the utilities at Google to really drive this mission and this problem that I saw in the community and, and use Google's space and, Google, and like Google's branding to now like work on the startup and integrate that together. So bottom line, I think like as long as you keep that passion and like that understanding, like that's what fulfills you um, and drive towards it, it might not happen automatically. Um, but there's always like steps that you can take to work towards either building the skills that eventually you'll be able to be work on your passion full time or work on like creating a community or, or leveraging a space or, or company or tool or money um, to put that together eventually. And, and it, it took me five years, but I'm like, I love the work that I do now and the team that I've built now because I, I love working with them. The conversations that we have are so empowering and I know the work that we're doing um, is important. Great, thank you. Um, cool. Um, do any of you see any, think of any of like the most pressing issues that we can address with technology or from the STEM field? Or can you think of anything um, that <laughs> off the top of your head? <laughs> anything you want to work on? <laughs> I think there's, there's so much to be done. Um, I constantly think about, um, there's a lot of commercial apps, right? There's a lot of social apps, there's a lot of commercial apps, but we've yet to see um, a breakthrough in terms of um, two particular fields that are like closely like passionate for me are healthcare and education. Um, there's so much to be done there. Um, not a lot of venture funding has gone into it. Only lately have we started seeing like um, more um, female venture capitalists fund um, female health related products, right? There's a whole like that kind of sector hasn't been innovated in in like decades, like decades. Um, and there's so much that can be done there um, that we're only beginning to see the light of. So I'm really excited to see um, how technology can integrate and um, fix so many problems or at least like improve and help um, help kind of like show light um, um, to situations um, that particularly impact that community. Yeah, yeah I think on that note, um, the, the reason why we decided at Dreamers Roadmap to become a nonprofit app was for that particular reason, right? That there's like very few to like no VC funding for apps that are solving problems, which is ridiculous. Like you would think like, oh, there'd be so many people wanting to solve problems through technology, um, but there isn't. And just recently, this is something that if you guys are interested in looking into something of that nature, look into Fast Forward. Uh, Fast Forward is an accelerator that's based here in the Bay Area who are accepting, um, they, they accept cohorts. I think they did like 10 last year. I was part of it. So they accept nonprofit apps. So basically, if you have an idea for an app that's going to solve a problem and you have a team, um, you could submit your application. And if you get accepted, you get $25,000 and you go through their whole cohort for the fall. And um, throughout the fall, you're gonna have these mentors from various tech companies who you'll meet and then, then use to leverage their networks to get more support for your project. And on demo day, you basically pitch your idea to a room full of very wealthy people, some VC people, but a lot of people who are willing to donate to projects like, like those. Um, so you get a lot of funding that way. So yes, it's a lot harder but the opportunity is there if you guys do want to get into that. Like, I'd love to talk to you guys after more about it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really it's really challenging. And yeah. I think our community um, needs to be able to see more opportunities in those, in those spaces because there's so much need in that. Yeah, I'll just add. Uh, so I was at South by Southwest uh, last week, and I was attending a panel around diversity in tech. And one of the founders of a site called I Love 
blackpeople, I think it is, dot com. <laughs> and it's essentially like a present day green book, if anybody is familiar with green book. And so it's a way that um, folks of color can travel in this country and even beyond in a way and be able to go in frequent places and spaces that are actually welcoming to them. Mm -hmm. And so one thing though, he, he had asked this question around, he well, he more so made a comment and he was talking about how, you know, he remembers in as a younger person in Brooklyn having a struggle to catch a cab. And in present day, that's still an issue where folks still take cabs, right? But Uber, is a solution for that type of discrimination that would occur on an ongoing basis. And so, but that a person of color did not discover or found um, Uber, but that is the type of thinking that I think we need to see more of amongst black and brown communities. And so it's I'm more so thinking about what are the issues that are plaguing us? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, what do you see on a day-to-day -day basis that frustrates you? And looking and thinking about, okay, what could I, how could I leverage technology to actually solve for this? That could in turn then be able to serve a much broader um, swath of folks, but it's really, it's kind of getting back to those roots of, for us, by us, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that is resurging in a way, and um, that is something that we really double down and emphasize at SMASH when working with our young people, is that it's not just about getting this degree, making a lot of money. It is about it, though, let's be clear. Um, but it's also thinking about how can you leverage these skills gained in a way that's gonna help your community, be it local, national, and or global. And so I think, you know, be it food justice, housing, um, healthcare is significant. Women health, female, women's healthcare is, is also um, in dire need of attention. Um, and even from a research standpoint, a lot of our um, ailments are, you know, have been around for quite some time, but it's just not a priority. So really thinking about who is not a priority in this country, and thinking about what are the problems that they face because they're not a priority and then using STEM to solve for that. Thank you all. Um, I'm gonna ask one more question because I know students have, might have class at one um, and I wanna give them a chance to ask questions as well. But just really quick, what's one piece of advice you would like to give to our students um, in their education or in their future, in their jobs and um, stuff like that? So. <laughs> I'll, I'll say one thing. Um, you absolutely belong. You belong in any space that you occupy and you have every right to um, make a difference. And it's gonna, it takes work though. Um, so it's not entitlement, um, but it's absolutely, you're more than capable. And so I just want to, I want to walk away with knowing that I shared that with you all um, and hopefully it, it resonates in as you move along this journey? Uh, to follow on that, I'd say use your identity as your strength. Um, where you come from, you're a great example of this. Um, use that to your advantage, not to your disadvantage. Um, and in particular, the ideas that you come up with are are very particular um, in a way that like the rest of the community or the majority community in tech present day hasn't even thought of them and will likely not because of their narrow perspective. So you have that unique opportunity that they don't um, to pursue something and make it big, make it huge um, because there's a lot of us. Um, and um, if we look at it globally, you wanna build products globally, like it's, there's not just white people, there's not just men globally. So. Um, you have a big population that you can change lives or you know your ideas can can impact. Um, so always think about, hey, like where I came from, what are the things that um, impacted me? How can I improve it? Um, because I have the stage to make this really big. Um, I think for me is to identify those people that truly uplift you in your lowest moments. Um, because if you are thinking of the tech route, being a person of color, or even the entrepreneur route, um, it's going to be really challenging, um, but it is worth it. 
it is worth it. Um, but I think, yeah, because of how challenging it is, you're going to need those people in your life to almost daily remind you that you do belong, that you are worth it, um, and that you could achieve whatever it is that you're trying to achieve. Oh, thanks. Um, so now I want to open up to Q&A with um, a few. Does anyone have any questions for our panelists? Yeah. Oh, OK. <laughs> microphone because so, we want to record the questions also how are you guys doing um, thanks a lot for being here today and um, inspiring the women in, in engineering um, is there any specific conferences or any specific programs out there that women in engineering could actually participate in outside of school there's a bunch. <laughs> um, you actually live in the Mecca of like tech conferences I think <laughs> Um, but most, the, the one that's coming up um, is Cloud19, an Apple Developers Conference. Um, so yeah, you, I can probably get you into tech, uh, Cloud19. Um, you can reach out to me and I can give you some information on that. But yeah, like literally if you just Google tech conferences, <laughs> um, you'll see a whole list of them like on a year calendar filled. Yeah. Yeah, when um, when I was a student, um, I got a scholarship to go to Grace Hopper, which is probably one that most of you have heard of, but it's a huge, huge conference. It's the biggest women in computing conference um, in the world. Um, it happens, it's happening in Houston this year, later this year in October. I think it's particularly really helpful for students because every company out there is gonna have a booth there um, and you have access to all of them. Um, that's where I got, that's how I got my first internship. Um, and so I would re definitely recommend that. Um, but there's also smaller conferences like in the Bay, but there's al always like companies that are doing scholarships for these conferences as well. So look out for that. Yeah, uh, definitely Grace Hopper. We took a cohort of our alum this past year um, and that proved to be really beneficial. Um, and we were in partnership with the Anita Borg Institute who runs the actual conference and so to your point around scholarships, uh, I know that when you first, at initial glance, it may be uh, daunting, right, because of the price tag that's associated with a lot of these large conferences, but there are more often than not different ways to go about getting financial support um, to attend. Tapia is another one um, that's very much focused around people of color in particular. And so that's another conference that I would recommend folks looking into. Afrotech is another conference that's actually going to be hosted in Oakland this year, um, where it's historically been over in San Francisco. So that's another um, venue. And there's definitely, there's a host of numerous conferences happening. I think I saw, does someone have their hand up over here? No, uh, yeah, yeah. I just was wondering if you could all repeat your names again clearly and where you're affiliated. Thank you. Sure. So Danielle Rose and I am with SMASH and smash.org um, is the website. I can be found on there and my email is just danielle at smash.org. Um, Sarah Goon Carr, um, I'm an engineer, but also the CEO and founder of Byte Board, um, funded through Google's incubator called Area 120. Um, my name is Sarai Espinosa Salamanca, <laughs> um, but my email is sarai at dreamersroadmap.org, founder and CEO of Dreamers Roadmap. And my email is sargoon at Google. <laughs> Good. Yeah. <laughs> My name's Katie Messina Silva. I'm one of the counselors here at Chabot. I'm a STEM counselor and also a counselor in the Dream Center. And so I just wanted to share two resources. Uh, we do have STEM counseling appointments available. Um, I have some uh, referral slips here. You can come and grab one from me before you go if you want to come and talk to a counselor about setting up a STEM ed plan. So if you're a STEM student and you need a little extra help and support in figuring out your classes, making a plan, talking about transfer, um, that's a great thing to do. And then also we have our Dream uh, Resource Center located over in El Centro. 
um, is just a resource center for undocumented students. I'm one of the counselors that works in there too. Um, and so we just have a lot of resources and support here at Chabot and we really wanna encourage students to come and take advantage of those um, supports because that support starts here while you're students. Um, I know that they talked a lot about finding that support in their careers and so I just wanna let everyone know that there's support here as you guys are moving forward in your journey um, towards your careers as well. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Um, and I also have the forms in the STEM Center, so if you need one in the future, you can come grab them for me. Cool. Um, do we have any other questions for our panelists? Yeah. Um, being a minority in technology and seeing how there's a disparity in just classrooms, like in my computer science class, it's almost like 45 and there's only three women. women. So it's kind of scary going into a workforce where people keep saying the men are dominant over it. So what keeps you going through that? And if you've ever been through obstacles where they treated you differently, what did you do? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. I, I can't speak to computer science in, in particular, but I definitely, um, my classes at Georgia Tech, I was one of maybe three or four um, in that same kind of ratio. And in, I think coming from Spelman, an all women's institute, uh, really helped ground me in a way that I felt rather mm, empowered and invincible of sorts. Um, I, I took a lot of knocks, but uh, I kept pushing through and I think that that really came from my, my community outside of what was happening in the classroom. Also really took the opportunity to tap into my TAs, tapped into um, the professors themselves. Uh, now they're not all gonna be welcoming, but you never know until you try. And so that was something that I really had to push myself on because again, I've, I'm an introvert, I don't really like you know, trying to step out there and talk to strangers, um, but definitely that was something that I had to do uh, in order to really thrive in these spaces where there weren't a lot of folks like me. The workplace is, is a bit of a different animal. Um, also grew very accustomed to not working with just all men, but uh, British men, and that's a little different, um, <laughs> culturally speaking. And so, uh, you know, it was, I, I heard a lot, I, had, I received a lot of comments, microaggressions, some macro, um, and really finding those different champions in that space was critical for me. That may not be in my direct department or in my direct line. In fact, it's more ideal that you find somebody outside of your direct line of management to really be able to talk to and confide in um, as things get challenging. And I know there's ERGs now in a lot of the spaces. We did at BP um, have some ERGs and, and just I, I was fortunate enough to be able to find different folks of color that could really help walk me through those environments and those experiences. Um, I would say that I, I had the privilege to kind of like figure out what teams I wanted to land at at Google. Um, there's so many different teams in I wasn't gonna join a team that was all men, like obviously. Um, so I sat out teams and then I would talk to the female engineers on the team about their experiences and make sh made sure not to join teams because that wasn't gonna be productive for my mental health, I knew that. Um, others, I have other friends who joined teams that were all men and then recruited more women, like more power to them. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing was to be conscious of my mental health, like after two years of like, you know, just focusing on engineering and like working on my team and coding all day, I realized it was getting burnt out um, and taking a step back and realizing like there are a lot of microaggressions that you just like swallow day to day or like a lot of anxiety that you carry day to day um, that you have to acknowledge and take care of. Um, I'm really lucky now we have a team of all female engineers just for our startup. Um, we're a team of four all female engineers and it just happened to work out that way. We put up a job position, interviewed, you know, and um, found the best engineers and that happened to be all female engineers. I will say that that team looks and feels so different every day. <laughs> it's just worlds apart. And like, I was like, is this how men feel every day when they walk? <laughs> like they just get to be cool and chill. Like they don't have to work. Like, 
it, it makes a difference. Um, and I realized that so starkly once I started my team. Um, so be conscious and ask for, you know, a place that best fits you. Yeah, and as far as me, like, I think I've just um, surrounded myself my, with more women that are that have the same particular interest that you have. Um, even though it is like, uh, like it sounds like in your classroom, it's very few of you. Um, look at other schools, look at other classes within campus or even outside of campus or even groups like on Instagram or Facebook. I don't know if you guys do, do Facebook still. Mm -hmm. um, but just like expand your network from just your classroom because there's a lot of other women and <laughs> here's another one <laughs> um, that you could like reach out to and get connected because I think that that's what has helped me just really surrounding myself and I'm also very spiritual so I would like read my bible um, and just like scriptures to remind myself I am a daughter of God I am good I, I do belong and I am going to do this so that's more on a personal <laughs> note <laughs> awesome thanks does anyone else have a question Cool. Um, well, if no one has any questions they want to ask in front of the group, um, that's okay. Uh, let's give a large round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming. You're great. Um, and yeah.